my favorite month of the year, I want to continue this new series, Lectuals Library, with four titles that have warmed my magic-obsessed heart. Whether you like fantasy magic or science fiction style magic, you may enjoy one of these titles or maybe all of them. Grab a libation, get comfortable, and let's get into my library picks. for a freshman can be scary enough without the added layer of occult magic, the ability to see ghosts, and cruel and wealthy legacy classmates. In Lee Bardugo's 2019 masterpiece Ninth House, main character Alex Stern is our portal into the dark magic unfolding at the fictional version of Yale University. She gets offered a free full ride to the school after a really fucked up tragedy, and the world building in this one is super lush. My favorite part was learning the strengths and weaknesses of the nine secret societies, including Lathe, the house that keeps all of the other ones in line, and that's where our girl Alex ends up. The arcane occultism really stands out amongst the backdrop of modern technology and college culture. Think human sacrifice related witchcraft juxtaposed with rape culture and new understandings of class privilege. Alex had wondered what was so special about the seniors selected by the societies every year. She thought there must be something magical about them, but they were just favorites, legacies, high achievers, charisma queens, the editor of the Daily News, the quarterback for the football team, some kid who had staged a particularly edgy production of Equus that no one wanted to see, people who would go on to run hedge funds and startups and get executive producer credits. The premise hooked me because I like imagining what insanely rich and privileged people get into behind closed doors, but also because Yale University is renowned for having secret societies housed in large buildings called tombs. The most known secret society is the Skull and Bone Society, founded in 1832 and included in Illuminati conspiracy theories. Famous members of the Skull and Bones include William Howard Taft, both George Bushes, William F. Buckley Jr., and Paul Giamatti. Yes, that guy from Big Fat Liar. The tombs inspired Lee Bardugo's writing. According to Curb.com, unlike normal clubhouses, members are rarely seen entering or leaving. Clubhouse walls are so thick, made of sandstone and marble in some cases, the sound never escapes, and there's no chance of a glimpse at what goes on inside because they're also windowless. Imagine what the fuck goes down in these unregulated and secretive buildings? Well, Lee Bardugo did. For instance, we learned that one house, who has the ability to change a person's perception and reality with food or drink, made a girl in 1982 think she was a tiger. The girl's parents still have her in a cage in upstate New York. It's a pretty nice setup. Acres to run on, raw meat twice a day. She got out once and tried to maul their mailman. This book has a pretty dark sense of humor and I love it. Bardugo said about her writing, I didn't come here to make you comfortable. I came here to write a book that's gonna fuck you up a little. I love this book for intertwining historical fiction, magic, dark academia, and modern critiques of campus culture. In between chapters, there were shady documents from in-universe manuals and diaries that add richness to the history that Bardugo has built. If you're like me, the book will leave you frantically Googling for information on the sequel, and FYI, it's called Hellbent, and it arrives in June 2023. I can't wait! Deliciousness rating, four out of 10. I give this book a nice below average score because food didn't go neglected, which is important to me in fiction. However, the descriptions of food were not robust enough for me, child, and it was basic American fare. They lived on Taco Bell and Subway when they were flush. Cereal, sometimes dry, sometimes soaked in soda if she got desperate when they were broke. She'd steal a bag of hot dog buns whenever they were invited to barbecues, so they had something to put peanut butter on. When Alex's co worker Dawes sues her, she makes her mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, tomato soup, green salad. When main character Darlington is living by himself in an utter desolation, he lives on beef jerky and Gatorade and chicken rolls from 7-Eleven. Damn, that's sad. Four out of 10. I am a humble woman who adores a pretty book and I'm not ashamed to admit that's what drew me to the first novel in this series, A Deadly Education. Whenever a book has a map inside the cover, I get revved up and the soft golden flap had me hooked. Thank goodness the book is actually great, right? Imagine that as a witch, instead of being shipped off to a fancy schmancy boarding school where you get three square meals a day, helpful teachers, and only one to three close calls with death a year, you end up in a prison-like institution where there are no teachers, generally no good food, and monsters lurk around every corner. Taking a shower, getting a meal, studying in the library, going to sleep, 
all of these simple tasks carry great risk of death when magical beasts hungry for the magic inside of young witches and wizards are constantly on the hunt for fresh meat. And Koyo even threw in a few grooming cantrips. Hair plating, a bit of glamour, and a deodorant spell, which I suppose was a polite way of hinting that I could stand a wash more than I do. I didn't need the hint, I already knew. But if it's a choice between stinking and survival, I'll choose to stink. I've never had a shower more than once a week in here, and often it's been longer. Even worse than skipping showering most of the time, you can't go home at all for the four years that you're there, or even communicate with your family. Could you survive the daily struggle and manage to turn in all your homework while learning new languages? That's the world facing our supremely dour anti-hero Galadriel, a powerful and lonely teenage witch prophesied to slaughter huge groups of people. The book's characters are extremely diverse with the scholar housing students from various magical enclaves around the world. The Scholomance, which is the name of the institution, of course, being filled with hormonal teens, constantly on the brink of death, means there's drama and gossip. Our heroine, who barely showers, can also harness dark magic, making her an outcast maleficer. Despite this, she attracts the attention, and some would say protection, of a popular and powerful wizard named Orion Lake. He was implying that the way I'd hooked Orion was by finding some shielding spell. They let me turn my room into a sanctuary for all night shagging, which I'd offered up in trade for Orion, bestowing the favor of his attentions on me. That was a completely reasonable assumption, of course. Like Ninth House, this book examines class and privilege in academia. Naomi Novik was inspired in part due to her irritation with the poverty and lack of diversity in the Harry Potter series. She said in an interview, magic doesn't cost anything, right? So why are the Weasleys poor? Half of them are adults, fully grown certified wizards, all of them apparently quite talented and smart. If magic doesn't cost anything except the time it takes to learn it and cast it, then the more wizards you have, the richer you are, right? Not too much on my favorite fantasy series, Naomi. But She's got a point. You can tell she really wanted to explore the economics of magic, and while irritated by Harry Potter, like so many writers who were frustrated with a timeless yet imperfect story, she was inspired by it when writing her own. She actively found ways to explore the unfairness in education and in magic rather than glaze over it. For instance, students are allotted a weight limit when coming to school, and rich kids from enclaves are often left gifts from previous classes while poorer ones are not. Therefore, they have stuff they need for classes that the poorer ones do not. I really get a kick out of the school's social pecking order as well as learning about various monsters called Mouths, like the dreaded Maw Mouth. And through Galadriel, nicknamed Elle, we get to hear about the history of the school and of the magical community in Novik's world building. She's a funny girl who ultimately comes out out of her woe is me shell, and the thrills are always waiting around the corner in this series. I am anxiously awaiting the third and final book in the series because it's been one of my favorite reads in a while. Matter of fact, I'm gonna reread this first one and the second one to prepare for the third one, which comes out in 2023. Wait, no! Wait, does it? I think it comes out. I think it comes out this month. Did it come out last month? Wait, wait! <gasps> September 20th, oh my God. I'm putting it in my cart right now. I need it. Wait, 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 wait. I'm in the middle of filming. Let me get back to work. <laughs> This series gets a 6.5 out of a 10 on the deliciousness rating. Quality food that doesn't try to turn into a monster and kill you is a serious luxury in the Scholomance. So early in the series, there are mentions of eggs and porridge, but nothing that really wows the reader. As the story unfolds and Galadriel makes alliances, she gains more access to food, like when she and two friends cash out at the school snack bar, which in exchange for a token, gives the student anything from a piece of salmon, fish that very morning, to a World War I military ration, and it's just cool shit like that that I love in this series. Today I got off-brand crisps, a packet of mostly crumbled peanut butter crackers, and the prize, a Mars bar, only three years past the sell-by date. Lou got a bag of salted licorice, which is inexpressibly vile, but you can swap it with the Scandinavian kids for almost anything. Also, shout out to this book for making me look up new foods, a bacon buddy, which in the UK is a bacon sandwich usually served with ketchup, butter, or brown sauce, a halva, which is a thick fudge-like candy that originated in the Middle East, and a hobnob, which is a rolled oat cookie that Galadriel and her friends smeared with chestnut spread.
If you're looking for something dark and magical with a bit of historical fiction, The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson may fit the bill. This one follows a 16-year-old biracial girl named Emmanuelle who was reared in a creepy, puritanical, and isolated society, very dystopian, named Bethel as an outcast because of her black father. The society is roughly 1,000 years old and there's a lush background of world building that you very quickly become familiar with. It's an amalgamation of settlements and cults rather than being solidly based on one particular place or cult. Because I did go into this thinking it was strictly based on the Salem witch trials or similar, but no, it's much more creative than that. The religion centers around the Holy Father, represented by the sun, light, and fire, and fighting the Dark Mother, the personification of moon, water, the forest, and witchcraft. Emmanuel's best friend is a white girl named Leah, who embodies all of the pictures depicting women in Bethel scripture. Emmanuel feels disconnected from the people around her, knowing that her father's side of the family lives in Bethel's outskirts. While on the outside she shared their features, the dark skin, the firm nose, the wide black eyes, she was not one of them, not really. For all Emmanuel knew, those who lurked on the roads may well have been her blood, relatives of her father, uncles or cousins perhaps, but she didn't claim them as such, and they in turn didn't claim her either. Because Emmanuel's an outcast, she's especially particular about appearing to be a pious and model young woman, but too bad there's magic leaking out of her. And you can't forget that living in a puritanical society sucks. In Bethel, it was a sin to swim. It was not modest or prudent to enter the water, for it was deemed the demon's domain, but Leah had taught Emmanuel in secret one summer, when they were both young and bold. Sinning in Bethel's society can mean being burnt alive, so clearly it's a very harsh society to live in, but also corrupt. Emmanuel's journey into a diary left by her deceased mother not only unravels her own family secrets, but exposes the church's many sins, namely those by the church's leader, a man known as the prophet. The prophet has multiple wives and each has a bride seal, or cut in their foreheads, designating them as his property. I wonder if the author was inspired by Charles Manson's followers. For Emmanuel, the math very quickly doesn't add up when she takes a closer look at the world around her. For instance, Emmanuel learns that a powerful member of the church sexually assaulted someone and had been doing so for years. Sadly, the victim says, he's just a man, men make mistakes. I love this book because it's beautifully written, it's feminist, and it's creepy. It also dealt with my favorite aspects of historical fiction, religious intolerance and abuse through a dystopian church, misogyny, and even plagues. In the days that followed, more than 200 fell ill, succumbing first to the fever, then to the madness after it. Emmanuel heard stories of grown men clawing their eyes from their sockets, chased women of the faith who stripped off their clothes and fled naked into the dark wood screaming as they went. You could easily knock this 356 page book with the beautiful and smooth dust jacket out in one to three sessions because it's that compulsively readable. A predominant theme is that of revenge and its consequences and for us that means there's more trouble brewing in an upcoming sequel. I can't wait to check out that sequel and also I want to check out Alexis Henderson's other novel House of Hunger next. This book gets a 6 out of 10 on the deliciousness rating because it doesn't really use enough adjectives on the food. On good days there'd be an assortment of biscuits and sweetbreads, scones and cookies, and on the very best days a bit of honeycomb or jam to go with them. Did these biscuits and scones and whatnot have raisins or other fruit in them? Were they crispy, soft, crumbly? I'm dying to know, but I guess I'll use my imagination. Someone set her down in a dining room chair, provided her with a steaming cup of raspberry leaf tea and a plate of eggs and fry cake, which she felt far too ill to eat. This is what saved the rating chow. Of of course I had to google what a fry cake is and it's basically a cake donut. I was very pleased it made me a little hungry. I like that. Magical ability is the reason why 12 year old Luke Ellis's parents are murdered and he is abducted and interred at a frightening place in a forest in Maine called the Institute. This novel by Stephen King is probably my favorite of his because it's so damn sinister. Graduating the institute is no celebratory occasion. All of the abducted children at the institute are telepaths and telekinetics whose magic is being channeled for something that you may determine to be ambiguous. The kids are kept in line with abuse, tokens for entertainment, and food. Let me give you some advice. You need to realize that you are here to serve, Luke. That means you have to grow up fast. It means being realistic. 
Things will happen to you here. Some of them will be not so nice. You can be a good sport about them and get tokens, or you can be a bad sport and get none. Those things will happen either way, so which should you choose? It shouldn't be hard to figure out. Tokens grant them access to alcohol, cigarettes, monitored computer access, etc. With Luke noting on page 125, you could get a pack of cigarettes for eight tokens, a small bottle of LaRue blackberry wine for five. What really makes the book thrilling and chilling is the absence of monsters and the absence of spell books and magic in the traditional sense. The children have magical abilities, but at the end of the day are just children, juxtaposed to adult military veterans, to technology, and a worldwide conspiracy that destroys their families and reputations in the case of escape. So with telekinesis and telepathy in a fortified complex, how do these children escape or fight back? It's a fun read. As always in King books, there are complex and interesting characters who are so realistic that at times you forget the horrors they're capable of. Because if people found out what we're doing, the hundreds of children we've destroyed, we'd be tried and executed by the dozens, given the needle like Timothy McVeigh said Miss Sigsby, who is an awful, awful person. My only real complaint in this book is that the black telepath Kalisha had a photo of Eldridge fucking Cleaver, the Black Panther and admitted rapist in her bedroom. When the kids are abducted, they wake up in bedrooms that are exact replicas of their room at home, except in the case of Kalisha. A framed picture of Martin Luther King stared at them from the bureau. She saw Luke looking at it and laughed. They try to make things the same as at home, but I guess someone thought the picture I used to have there was taking it a little too far, so they changed it. Or shit, maybe they just thought an admitted rapist wasn't the proper role model for a black female child, but you know, whatever. Now, I guess if she was raised by hoteps, okay, I understand the picture, but King couldn't have picked more admirable men like Malcolm X, or even a woman like Asada Shakur. Oh well, no book of character is perfect, damn. This book gets an eight out of 10 on the deliciousness rating. Food is important in the Institute because it's the literal bread of the bread and circus charade used to keep the abducted children docile. Recalls Kalisha, the black telepath, on Friday nights and Sunday noons, there are buffets, all you can eat. The adjectives were lacking, but it definitely made me hungry just because of the sheer overwhelming, you know, sentences that involved food. Take this quote. He reached for the stack of menus in the center of the table and handed them around. At the top was the day's date. Below that was starters, buffalo wings or tomato bisque, entrees, bison burger or American chop suey, and finishers, apple pie a la mode or something called magic custard cake. For students near the brink of death, the food changes, matching the environment and the hopeless of their fates. About a dozen kids sat eating what smelled to Avery like Denty Moore beef stew. His little sister liked it. She was probably dead too. Most of the kids looked like zombies. And there was a ton of slobbering. He saw one kid, a girl, who was smoking a cigarette as she ate. As Avery watched, she tapped ash into her bowl, looked around vacantly, and began eating from it again. That's it for this episode of Lectuals Library. Let me know if you've read any of these books or if you have any dark magic recommendations in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you like and subscribe.